In this video, I want to go through some mathematical notation that you're going to see a lot in this class. And I'm going to call this index notation, but there's kind of two things I'm going to be talking about here. One is summation, and the other is going to be the delta function. So the idea of summation is that we might want to, for instance, take the inner products of these two things. So for instance, maybe we have b and the inner product of a. So one way to do that would be to simply take this and say, OK, I need to complex conjugate. So this becomes e to the negative i pi over 3, 1, 1. And this becomes the same thing it originally was. OK. And then we can multiply it out, row, column, you get your answer. Now, another way to write this is going to be the sum of bi. And in this case, we're thinking about, for instance, um, this being a1, a2, a3, b1, b2, b3. So b star, because we had to complex conjugate it, a. But then we would say, for instance, i, i, where i is going from 1 to 3. And there's slightly different ways of doing this. And the key here is we're saying we're going to sum them. We're going to be multiplying the complex conjugate of this value times the value of a, but not all possible combinations. And you'll see these written different ways depending on whether you're like maybe ma multiplying two, um, two ma matrices together. But in this case, we only want the first element of this with the first element of that. So the i is the same. And so when we do this out, the first one here, we have to complex conjugate it. So negative i pi over 3 times the first one of a times 3 plus, right, this summation is adding. So we're adding these three different terms. So this here represents b1 star a1. The next term would be the second one, 1 complex conjugated times i, not complex conjugated. And again, this is going to be now b2 star a2. And then our last term here is again 1 times 5. So that represents our b3 star times a3. So this is a more compact way of denoting this. And one of the reasons we would want to do that is maybe our elements get really, really large. The other thing that we're going to get into is we start working with many matrices or vectors, so maybe two or three of them multiplied in succession there's going to be certain mathematical relationships we can use to actually simplify this a little bit. So writing it out in this sort of form will sometimes actually be a shortcut. In this case, it doesn't necessarily feel like this is any faster than doing that. So another place that this comes up is the delta function. And you'll often see it written like this. And what this means is that this is equal to 1 if i is equal to j and it's equal to 0 otherwise. And so you can actually think of this as, for instance, here, saying that this is like bj times ai times the delta function. But that does just simplify to saying the i values have to be the same. right? So and again, that was more of a 2 rather than a comma. Um, so, so the delta function is really helpful, and you just have to recognize it. What's a little bit confusing is that there's two types of delta functions. One of them is this discrete case, where we assume that these are indices. And another delta function is actually a continuous function. So you might see something like this. This is still a delta, and it's going to actually have some of the same roles mathematically of picking out certain values. But this actually is in, uh, basically an infinitely skinny spike defined here to be at x equals 2. So right now, we're not worrying about that. Right now, we have this discrete one. And again, you'll see this come up in, in different types of index notation. So hopefully, you've seen the summation symbol before, and you're OK with this. And this delta function is then to just know um, that it's 1 if they're the same, 0 else. And where this comes in, for instance, is if you have some sort of generalized um, state where this is a i a j, we would usually say, oh, that's just equal to the delta function, meaning that if these are the same, if these are the same states, um, well, then that's just the normalization condition. That's one. 
Otherwise, they're orthogonal. So this is another way of expressing orthonormality. So normalized if they're the same, zero otherwise because they're orthogonal. So a little bit of practice, again, it might be new to you depending on what courses you had before. One thing to note is that in some classes, especially when you get into certain um, general relativity and more advanced things, um, anytime you start to see um, indices, it actually implies summation. I think in this book we always actually write out the summation, but just know in the future sometimes this is implied simply by seeing these index uh, indices here. And that can be really confusing the first time you see it. So. Hopefully this right now is not too confusing.